سو بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم احمد ہُو و صلی اللہ رسول الکریم اما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإن آمنوا بمثل ما آمنتم به فقد احتدوا فإن تولوا فإنما هم في شقاق سيكفيكهم الله وهو السميع العليم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي الحمد لله الذي أكرم الذي خلق الإنسان وكرم اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى آل محمد Today I want to talk about a very important topic and that is what is authentic Islam and what are the boundaries of authentic Islam and I at some point slowly will be mentioning giving entire lectures on literally each and every point that I'm going to be making today What is authentic Islam and what is the effect of imperialism on authentic Islam? So both of these topics I'm going to cover today, but today will be mostly a summary. So <coughs> first I want to give you a tamthil that is also from the Quran and is amongst the common metaphors of Quran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَسْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ وَفَرُّهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ The example of kalimatu tayyiba, a true, a good word. Okay, يعني the good word is لا إله إلا الله كَلِمَةُ tayyiba, Or any good word. Or the word of Allah himself. So مَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ is like a good tree. What is a good tree? فَرُّ Asluha thabitun. Its roots and its foundations are firmly rooted. Wafarruha fi sama, and its branches are high. So that's the example of a good word. Okay, the good word is not that uh, we didn't know the truth for one thousand four hundred years, and all of a sudden we discovered it now. That's not firmly grounded in the root. Okay, that's not firmly grounded in in the ground. That's not a tree that has grown. So, now, <clears throat> the first point is the Qur'an itself. Qur'an is the miracle of Islam. It is the living miracle, the living guidance. There is no guidance, especially in times of fitna. Especially in times of fitna, there is no guidance better than the guidance of Qur'an. And the Qur'an is the criterion, Furqan, by which we will finally know if anything itself or is, is or is not authentic. <coughs> so I will leave this point because I'm going to discuss the Qur'an in more detail. But the only point I want to make for people to consider, okay, is that the authentic jama'a, ahlu sunnah wal jama'a, the authentic jama'a group, the authentic party, which the Prophet has also called Ta'ifatam Mansura, the group that Allah will help. Okay. That that is that group is those people that focus on the importance of the memorization and the teaching of Quran. They focus on the importance of memorization of Quran, the proper recitation of the Quran, the proper understanding of Quran, the proper propagation of Quran. They're the people that are doing jihad with Qur'an. As the Qur'an itself says, وَجَاهِدْ بِهِ Do jihad with this Qur'an. Jihadan kabira, A big jihad. And this Qur'an is the miracle of miracles of miracles of miracles. It's miracle from day one and it's a miracle till the end. And when we go to Jannah, we'll listen to Allah reciting Qur'an. And people's ranks will be raised in, in the hereafter by their reciting Qur'an. So Qur'an is the ultimate, 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 ultimate criteria of haqq. And whatever the Qur'an points to is haqq. So what does the Qur'an point to? So we start with where the Qur'an points to. Today I won't be showing that many ayat because this is a summary. And as I said, I will be exfoliating, discussing this, expanding upon this discussion today, each and every single point in further and further details. Today, I want to give a summary of what is authentic Islam. Then what is the 
effect of imperialism on this authentic Islam? And what is therefore not authentic Islam? This is something every Muslim should know. Okay? So let's start with the first thing. The first principle I want to mention is in ayah number 150 of Surah An-Nisa. Those people who deny the truth of Allah and His Messenger. Now in the Quran, how many times you find Allah and His Messenger? Billahi wa rasulihi, billahi wa rasulihi, billahi wa rasulihi, right? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَيُرِيدُ أَنْ يُفَرِّكُ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ And they want to make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger. They want to separate Allah from the Messenger. And they want to get rid of the Messenger. They want to do away with the Messenger. Or So, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ Those who deny Allah وَرَسُولِهِ and his messenger يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يُفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَيَقُولُونَ نُؤْمِنُوا بِبَعْدٍ وَنَكْفُرُوا بِبَعْدٍ And as a result, they say we believe in part of it, we reject part of it. We believe in some parts of Qur'an and we reject some parts of what the Prophet said, or what the Prophet taught, even though we know it may be authentic. نُؤْمِنُوا بِبَعْدٍ وَنَكْفُرُوا بِبَعْدٍ يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَّخِذُوا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ سَبِيلًا they want to find a way out between the two because they don't like some things in hadith. And, and what's the reason to reject hadith? Primarily, it's an emotional reason. It is the effect of imperialism, which I'm going to talk about later. But the real reason is because you want to be liberal and you want to deny that there are hurs in Jannah and you want to deny that, uh, you know, that, that because of your liberalism, you want to reject hadith and you want to accept Quran. And then for Quran, Quran's not tied to anything. And then you can interpret Quran like Protestant Christians to anything you like. Right? So, Now look at the warning of Allah in the next ayah. Those who do kufr, who deny the truth of Allah and His Messenger. And they want to make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger. They want to, if Allah said do something and the Prophet said do something, they say, no, they're not the same. They make a distinction. Now, of course, in legal Islam, there's a distinction. That's how we know the difference between fard and sunnah. Okay? That what Allah said is fard, right? Like aqimu salat. The Allah said, establish the prayer, that's fard. The Prophet commanded, have a beard. It's not fard, it's sunnah. But it's if you don't do that sunnah, and it's a command of the Prophet, you're still liable for sin. Okay? So, but they want to make a distinction. No, you don't have to listen to the Prophet. Just do away with the Prophet. Okay? Let's not worry about what the Prophet said. So, يُرِيدُ أَن يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ They want to distinguish between Allah and His Messenger. وَيَقُولُونَ نُؤْمِنُوا بِبَعْدٍ We believe in part of it. وَنَكْفُرُوا بِبَعْدٍ And we reject the other part. Yuridu and Allah says, what is their aim? What is their illa? So to say, Yuridu an yattakhidu bayna dhalika sabila. They want to find a middle way, a more liberal way between them. Because with the Prophet, you have a synchronicity between Quran, like for example, praying. Right? So you have this synchronicity between Quran and Sunnah by which you can verify one with the other. Okay? And you can verify Quran with Sunnah, and then you can verify Sunnah through Quran. So they don't want this tied down Islam. They want a liberal Islam. What does Allah say about them? أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ حَقًّا These people, they are true kafirs, حَقًّا, without any doubt. أَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا muhina, And we have prepared for these people who reject the truth and try to dis make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger, try to divide Allah and His Messenger. We have made for them, أَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا muhina. Okay, <clears throat> we have given them, a, we're going to give them a very shameful punishment. And then Allah says what? The opposite of that. <inaudible> Those who believe in Allah and His Messenger, <inaudible> they don't make a distinction between any of them. Allah said it, His Messenger said it, it's the same. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَلَمْ يُفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ, uh, منهم لم يفرق بين أحد منهم أولئك سوف يؤتيهم الله يؤتيهم أجرهم أجر أجرهم 
and we will soon give them their reward. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ اللهم جعلنا منهم. And Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. The true believers are who don't make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger. Now what does that mean? Okay, That means there's no distinction if Allah said it or his, He said it. In His own lifetime, the same mouth of Rasulullah is saying, Allah said this. It's the Qur'an. That same mouth is saying, I want you to pray like this. The source of the Qur'an and the source of the statements, personal statements of the Prophet are the same. Those who make, want to disti- make a distinction between these two. The distinction between Allah and His Messenger. No, no, Quran will accept, but Rasulullah, what he said, even if it's authentic, even though it is verified, even though it is historically verifiable, even though it's coming from five different cities, from people who never knew each other, but they're all saying the same thing. Even then they'll reject it. Why? What's the real reason? The real reason is the effect of this imperialism. So this was point number one. Now I'm going to come to the role of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam later on. Okay, later on I'm going to talk about the, you can say, Alum, Muham, alum of Muhammadiyah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what that entails. But let's go on to the next point. Next point is the absolute relationship. Absolute, notice my words, absolute relationship. And the deep relationship between Quran and the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Quran is one time saying, fight them. Another time Quran is saying, make peace with them. One time Quran is saying, ahsan bainaka wa bainahu hamim. That that you do du'a for them, you do good to them, even if they're being bad to you. Do da'wah to them. Another place is saying, fight them. How do you distinguish between these different aspects? Without the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, the ayat of hijrah and jihad and da'wah and forgiveness and all of those, they become contradictory to one another. Without the seerah of the Prophet. And the most basic thing about Qur'an that is connected to the seerah of the Prophet is if this is a Makki surah and a Madani surah. Why? Because to be able to arrange what came first, what came second, what came third, what came fourth, you have to understand Qur'an in the context of when it was being revealed, in what situation it was being revealed. The Qur'an and the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ are absolutely inseparable. Anyone who says otherwise, let me give you just one small example of this. Okay, let me give you one small example of this. For example, Quran will mention events. You don't know which battles are which without the seerah of the Prophet. When Quran is mentioning any of the battles, Quran doesn't say this is a battle of Badr and this is a battle of Ahud, this is the battle of Ahzab. The Quran doesn't mention this is Tabuk. You have to know the seerah of the Prophet to be able to tell. Which battle is this referring to? Why did the Muslim, why is Quran saying we lost in this battle? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make battle of Badr, Yawmul Furqan? How can you know that without the seerah? But I'm going to give you one more example. Illa tansuruhu. Oh Muslims, if you don't support the Prophet in his cause, faqad nasar Allahu. Allah has already supported his cause. Is akhrajahu alladhina kafaru thaniyath name. When, okay, when they were taken out of their uh, taken out, meaning in their hijrah, when they were kicked, kicked out, you can say, Kafaru is akhrajahu alladhina kafaru thaniyath name. When the two were kicked out from their homes, is huma fil ghar, when they were in the cave. Who was in the cave? Who is this referring to? How can you know who are the people being referred to that were in the cave? Okay, without the seerah of the Prophet. When both of them were in the cave, when he said to his sahabi, his sahibihi, okay, when he said to his companion, La tahzan, Allah, do not be sad. Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us. Allah is with me and you. And the word of Allah is true forever about Abu Bakr. Allah is with you. Allah is with us. Okay. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُدُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Sakina on him. Sakinatahu alayhi in singular. Either they both, Allah said on him, 
meaning Allah and, and Abu Bakr became like one, okay? Or on Abu Bakr. Sakinatahu alayhi, na alayhima. Wa ayyadahu, and he strengthened him. Bi janudin lam tarawha, with an army that you don't see. Wa ja'ala kalimatan ladhina kafaru sufla. And the made Allah made the word of the disbelievers low. And the word of Allah is most supreme. Wallahu Azizun Hakim. Allah is Al Aziz Al Hakim. Okay? The authority and power and wisdom belongs to Allah. Allah knows when to do what. Now, what why am I mentioning this? Is to give you the relationship between the Quran and the Seerah. When your understanding of Quran is congruent to Seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, when your understanding of Quran and Seerah are congruent, this is why every Muslim should know the life of the Prophet. And this is why the Quran says, don't make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger. Because to understand what Allah is saying, you have to know the macro view. At the very least, you have to know what happened first in his life, what happened second in his life, what happened third in his life, what, which battles these were, which battles we lost, which battles we won, which battles we tied. All of these things, when, when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah took place, what Surah is talking about. Without, this, without the Seerah, you can't understand Quran. You'll be just guessing, guesswork. You'll be, you'll be not tied to anything real. You have to have a strong foundation. Like the Quran says, the Kalima of Allah is Ulya, most high. And I mentioned that verse in the beginning. Kalimatin tayyibatin ka shajaratin tayyibatin asluha thabitun. Asluha thabitun. Its roots are firmly grounded. So Islam is firmly grounded. And the word of Allah is most supreme. When what? When you are rooted in the ground properly. And how are you rooted in the ground properly? Number one, Quran. Quran is our guidance. Quran is our nur. And then the Quran points to other forms of guidance, like the Quran points to the sun, to the moon. The Quran points to different aspects of history. The Quran tells us something about the Prophet. The Quran tells us something about his companions. All these are forms of guidances that the Quran is pointing to. Okay? And I'm saying here, point number two, point number one was, لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُفَرِّقُونَ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Those who want to make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger, those versus those who make no distinction. If Prophet Muhammad is here with me and he tells me, I want you to pray this way, I'm going to pray that way. I don't have to find it in Quran. The Prophet is here, he's telling me to pray in a certain way. Okay? <clears throat> now, second is, that you cannot make, you have to make congruency between your understanding of the seerah of the Prophet and your understanding of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is bringing a revolution, a change in society. And if you don't know what the Prophet did first and you don't, don't know what he did second and which verses relate to which aspect and when and at what time, if you don't relate to that, then you won't be able to understand what was the methodology the Prophet brought, used to change the whole of society. Now again, this is a very long topic, which I will then uh, mention in more detail at another time, inshallah. So now we go to now point number three. Point number three is about the companions of the Prophet For that, I want to mention three parts of the Qur'an just to make it suffice. Otherwise, another time I'm going to maybe delve in this. You can do a whole six-hour, seven-hour talk just on the companions of the Prophet in the Qur'an. But of that, one of the significant ones is this verse, ayah number 137 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, And if they believe, meaning others, بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ Like as you all have believed. You here is not in singular. You all in the plural. Not you, Prophet Muhammad. آمَنْتُمْ آمَنْتُمْ As you all companions of Prophet Muhammad have believed. فَقَدْ اِحْتَدَوْا Then you will be guided. I'm about to give you a very big principle of guidance in Islam now. 
Whoever turns away from the companions of the Prophet, they'll always be in dispute. And listen to me now. Generally, people that go misguided, they don't say anything about Allah and His Messenger. You have those groups that try to make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger, like the so-called Qur'aniyuns or the only Qur'an fraud. But then there are those people who, within Islam, then they will make tanqeed or they will make uh, they will try to point out the the problems of the companions of the prophet as a whole we don't say about any one particular person but as a whole we say if you believe you have to believe like they believed this is what the quran says and we find that anyone who calls to Allah and his messenger and turns away from the companions of the Prophet, they're just in divided in groups. Like the Qur'aniyun, there's no one group, right? They can't be united in their own understanding of Qur'an. In fact, they actually dislike one another very much so if you look into the issue. One Qur'aniyun totally disagrees with the epistemology and the methodology of another Qur'aniyun. And the same thing with the, our brother, or the Shia brothers. Because they also curse the companions of the Prophet many times. So what happens? They don't have any agreement amongst themselves. So they have so many marajir. And now they're running into problems because of this amongst themselves. With this movie, The Lady in Heaven, made by the Shia, and yet the Iranian government's against it. So anyway, this is a longer discussion. But the general principle is the Prophet would only be successful. As the last messenger of Allah, if he had a companion and a community that he built that was a role model for the rest of humanity. And if he failed to do that, he'd failed to deliver the message to his, his, his direct recipients. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks that, no, the Prophet was completely successful. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Today I have completed my deen for you. Meaning that system, that social order, that system of justice, that khilafah has now been established. Okay, now just over here, just to make the point very quickly, I want to go over two other verses of the Quran that mention the companions of the Prophet We already read the previous verse, which calls Abu Bakr sahibi, a sahabi. Okay, you can't tell me the Prophet is in his grave with two companions of his who were his biggest enemy. Okay, and they're there by him for 1400 years. And you can't tell me that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has no uh, significant place in Islamic discourse as some people would like to make it. That if the Allah established Makkah for himself, he established Medina for his Prophet. If the earliest people about whom Allah says, now completely keep this in mind, Sutul Waqiyah, what does it say? It divides humanity into three parts. As-sabiqun, as-sabiqun, ula'ika al-muqarrabun. Okay, as-sabiqun, the people who win the race. Who are they, primarily? Allah mentions in Surah Tawbah, as-sabiqun, awwaluna min al the first of the sabiqun, awwaluna min al-muhajirin wal-ansar, amongst the muhajirin and ansar, wal-ladhina taba'ahum bil-ihsan, and those who followed them in the best way, what? Allah, Allah has prepared gardens, residential gardens, underneath which rivers will flow. Allah is happy with them. Allah is happy with them and they're happy with Allah. Who? as And what does Allah tell us in Surah Al-Waqi'ah about as sabiqun as sabiqun as sabiqun thullatun min al wa qalilun min al So many from the first generations and so few from the last generations. So, so many of them, Allah says, Thulla. So many of them will be guided, will be as sabiqun from the first generations, and just a few. And this word sabiqun is used for the companions of the Prophet in Surah Al Tawbah. In Surah Al Waqiyah, Allah uses it for the people of the highest level of Jannah. Not Ashabul Yameen, not the people of the right hand. Right? So, because people of the right hand, there'll be many in the beginning and many at the end. Thullatu min al awwalin wa thullatu min al akhirin. So, in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Muhammad Rasulullah wal ladina ma'ahu. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those that are with him. What are their primary qualities? Ashidda ala al kuffar. They're very stern and harsh against those who reject the truth. And ruhama'u baynahum. And they're merciful to each other. 
Those people that are not on authentic Islam, what happens? They show affection to the disbelievers and they're harsh on the Muslims, like the Khawarij, the Khawarij type attitude. And the Khawarij, they're also harsh on the companions of the Prophet What did the Prophet say? This, you know, Dr. Isra'i, I'll mention one thing about him. In the roundtable uh, talks that he had, when he was, you know, people were, uh, different intellectuals were talking about Islam, this happened in history, this happened in history, this happened in history. He said, look, for me, history of Islam, Islam is what the Quran entails, which is what? Allah, his messenger and his companions. And so Islam, the model of Islam ends at Hussein. Okay. And sorry, at Hassan, radiallahu anhum, ajma'in. So, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Hassan. Five. This is the role model. Every time the Muslim, uh, is, Muslim autonomy is established, the Muslim khilafah is established, this is the role model we will be looking at. This is what we will be striving to become. Always. Okay? And this is what we're striving to become in the end of times. The, the reestablishment of the khilafah. The total Islam, the entire social justice order of Islam. And so Allah and His Messenger, so the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alaikum Sunnati, upon you is my Sunnah, wa Sunnatul Khulafa al Rashidin al Mahdiheen. And the Sunnah of my Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar. After all, the Quran also talks about the compilation of the Quran in Surah Luqman. And that compilation of the Qur'an didn't happen in the time of the Prophet. It happened in the time of the Khulafa. Abu Bakr was the first one to try to... Uh, he did one stage, one of compilation of Qur'an. Verifying its authenticity from the skeletal text that the Prophet had left behind with his scribes. And then Uthman radiallahu anh further refined that and expanded that and gave that to the rest of the Muslim Ummah that read from this skeletal text. So, the Islam is the from the Nabuwa, the beginning of the prophethood of the Prophet, to the end of thirty years after that, which ends at Hassan's Khilafah. Okay, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and Hassan. The, this is Islam. This is the you could say the the model. This is the idealism of Islam. Okay, this these people were a sabiqun. These were the people that were running towards Allah. Ma great majority of them, they were amongst the loyalists of the loyal to the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so now I have, I will do a full lecture on this very point, but I want to end with this verse here. فَإِنْ آمَنُوا If they believe بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِحْتَدَوْا if you believe as they have believed, meaning the companions, then you have been guided. And if you turn your backs, then they're just in disarray, they're in dissension, disagreement with one another. Unless you have the synchronicity between Allah, meaning Quran, his messenger, meaning his sunnah, and the sahaba's understanding of the sunnah and the Quran, unless you have that in mind, that is intact, and that system that they established, the khilafah, unless that is representative of that teachings of the Quran and the sunnahs of the Prophet, unless that's not in your mind, you're misguided. And then this same point is mentioned in the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا and when it is said to them, believe, kama aman al nas, the way people have believed, qalu an mu'minu, should we believe, kama aman al sufaha, like these fools have believed? Meaning, who is here, believe as the people have believed, as the companions of the Prophet? And then there are those who say, oh no, they're fools, we don't need them. We don't need their understanding, they were all wrong. All the companions of the Prophet were wrong, we don't need their understanding of Islam. Fa Allah says, wa idha qila lahum, when it is believed, when it is said to them, believe like the companions believed. Okay, and what did the companions believe? That's how you know, because they were the recipients of the guidance. They know best what Allah meant and His Messenger meant. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُوا Should we believe? كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَا Like the fools have believed. Allah, Allah declares, those people who say this type of statement want to dismiss the companions of the Prophet. Allah, beware. إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ السُّفَهَاءُ They're the fools. وَلَكِنْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But they don't know it. They don't get it. 
Okay. When it is said to them, believe as the Sahaba have believed, like the people have believed. Should, should we believe as the fools believe? Like these Sahaba, they didn't know what they were doing. They made all these mistakes. And so if you have that type of attitude, Allah innahum humu sufaha'u, and know it well that they are the fools. Walakin la ya'lamun, but they don't know it. Okay, so now this is the first complete, you can say, chapter of what I wanted to talk about. Now, I talked about don't make a distinction between Allah and His Messenger, number one. Number two, you have to believe as the companions believed. And now over here, then I talked about the Khilafah, the whole 30 years. That is Islam. Okay. And whoever makes fun of them and the model that they establish and the Khilafah that they establish and their understanding of Islam and their implementation of Islam and their understanding of the social justice order of Islam, they're the actual fools according to the Quran. Now, over here I now want to mention something very important. <clears throat> I should have started with this point, but I'm going to mention it now. That is the last part of this verse 11, okay? Of uh, Sutul Fatir, I believe. But Allah says, Laysa ka mithlihi shay. About Allah, this is the one thing I want to make clear. What is our iman about Allah? In summary, okay, the, out of the 13 basic attributes of Allah, I feel this is the most important for the modern man to understand. Number one, this is muhkam. Laysa ka mithlihi shay. There's nothing like him at all. But he's listening and he sees. But his listening is nothing at all like our listening. He doesn't listen through organs. He doesn't have an ear like us. He doesn't see through eyes. He doesn't have lens. His hearing and seeing, this is, this is uh, amongst ayatul mutashab. We don't know what it means. We know it is because Allah said it is. What we know for sure is there's nothing, 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 absolutely nothing like him. Let me explain that to you in one more way so it becomes clear. Everything I can imagine will be somehow like me. If I imagine a rock, rock is like me because it's within time and space. It has destiny, it's affected by gravity and so on and so forth. Everything I can imagine to the farthest extent of my mind's imagination it has some similarity to me. This, this, this restriction does not exist for Allah. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There's absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing like Allah. Allah can hear the colors. And Allah can see the sound. Because the names and attributes of Allah are permanent in His relationship to His creation. But I'm not going to go there right now. Only I want to make clear, there's abs I can't think of something beyond my imagination. And whatever is in my ima imagination is somehow like me. But this, this distinction does not exist for Allah. لَيْسَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ There's nothing like or equal to Allah at all. وَرَاءُ الْوَرَاءُ ثُمَّ وَرَاءُ الْوَرَاءُ And nothing has any effect in the entire universe without the permission of Allah. If I take medicine or read Surah Al-Fatiha, in both cases the cure will come by the permission of Allah. There's no distinction, no, no difference. If the fire is going to burn, by the permission of Allah. Fire is not going to burn, by the permission of Allah. No distinction. So at the level of imaniyat, it's so important to understand that Allah is like absolutely nothing we can possibly ever, ever, ever imagine. Beyond space and time, beyond space and time, beyond the beyond. I was just adding this to, add to, then under this will be, there's no distinction between Allah and His Messenger. Under this will be, believe as the companions of the Prophet have believed. Under this will be, uh, for you is my sunnah and the sunnah of Khulafa al-Rashidin al mahdiyin Okay. Now, the Quran establishes, as-sabiqun al-awwalun. 
The Quran clarifies this as three generations, the first three generations, and their understanding of Islam. And then that is, and, and Qarn can mean century too, it can mean generation too. So up to the first 300 years. And in the first 300 years, most of the Hadith books that we know commonly, they were written within the first 300 years. Now, I want to move on and I'll come back to the Prophet and you can say the Alum Muhammadiyah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What are the aspects of that that are very important? Later I will talk about that. I have to do with what is authentic Islam. Number two now. Now this is chapter two I'm starting. You can say of my discussion. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this is the last deen, this is the last religion. In the previous ummah, what happened? That whenever the ummah started going astray, a new prophet came, then a new prophet came, then a new prophet came, but no more prophet is going to come now. So how will the ummah be guided? And the Prophet ﷺ said, all those things will happen to us that happened to the previous ummah. So if they were given guidance after their, their main prophet, Musa, and other prophets were coming following the Sharia of Musa والسلام, and following the Torah, and the prophets were coming and teaching, reviving the people, reviving Iman in their hearts, reviving Islam in their hearts of that time. So how will this ummah be guided? It's been so now so long, 1,400 years. Is there any way that Allah has put to keep the guidance of this ummah straight? And the answer is yes. And they're called the Mujaddideen. The Prophet ﷺ has said, In Allah yab'asu ala ra'si kulli mi'atin amin man yujaddidu laha deenah. Allah will raise in the beginning of every century. And we know this hadith is authentic, not only because it is authentic in terms of narration, but we also know it's authentic because we saw this happening to the tree of Islam, that every century there would be a revival. The Prophet said, in the beginning of every century, there will be somebody who will revive the deen. And we have found this to be consistently, consistently true every century. Every century. So for example, in some centuries there was more than one great person. Like for example, in the 5th century, there was Imam Ghazali, who is considered probably the most prominent of them. But you also have Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani. You also have Abu Hassan Shadli, Rahimullah. So, such great people. But in the 1st century, you have Omar bin Abdul Aziz, who re-established Khilafah, re-established that system that was lost from the time of the Prophet Wasallam and the first 30 years. He re-established Omar bin Abdul Aziz. Then again, you have the second century reviver, uh, uh, according to Abu Hassan Nadwi it is uh, Hassan, uh, um, it is uh, Hassan Basri rahmatullahi. This third century, there's almost ijma on the third century. Abu Hassan Ashri rahmatullahi, he revived Islam in the third century, like this, so on and so forth. And I'm going to talk about the last four centuries in in that in this regard, but. There have been people coming from Salahuddin Ayyubi, like Salahuddin Ayyubi, people reviving Islam every century. And which Islam did they belong to? Which Islam did Omar bin Abdul Aziz belong to? Did he belong to the Qur'aniyun? He was the first one of the, of the rulers to actually formalize the writing of Hadith. What about Hassan Basri? He didn't quote Hadith. He didn't quote narrations. He quoted narrations even of the Sahaba. What about Imam Ghazali? Read his writings. Read the writings of all the Mujaddideen. How the, what Islam they were calling towards. What Islam they were reviving. Read the life of Salahuddin Ayyubi. Which Islam did he follow? Which, which uh, uh, mazhab did he follow? Which tariqah did he follow? I'm not saying that within Islam there's a, there's a large range. I'm not saying you must have a tariqah and so on and so forth. No, I'm not saying that necessarily. It's good to have that. It's good to be connected to tradition, which I'll explain later when I talk about the effect of modernity on uh, the authentic Islam, when I talk about that. But first, what is authentic Islam? And then why, uh, what are the aspects of this authentic Islam that have been smudged, have been affected by imperialism? And what needs to now be done? So this is, I'm going to talk towards the end. This is going to be, uh, you know, this obviously would need a lot more discussion and a lot more deliberation. But I'm giving you the summary today. So, 
You have the Mujaddideen in every century who are reviving Islam and you can see for yourself who are the key figures in the history of Islam that revived Islam and if there's a correlation of Mujaddid al-Fasani and Shawlullah and Abu Hassan, uh, Mahmud al-Hassan rahmatullahi with Umar bin Abdul Aziz, with Imam Ghazali, with all these other Imam Rumi rahimahumullah. So all of these Mujaddideen, which Islam did they call towards? You know, the tree of Islam, you can say the seeds, the seed of that tree was the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And then that tree now grew and it had roots, right? And the tree is growing. You can't go back to the original. And it's true. The genes are there. The genes are there, but you can't go back to the seed. You can't really, really, really go back to Quran and Sunnah. There's no such thing because history has gone on. The alums have been made, which I'm going to talk about later. The different sciences that were made. And what are key aspects of uh, certain key aspects of that? I might touch upon that. But Islam is a tree growing, and every every century there's somebody reviving this, taking things to the next next level. Okay, so this, so the Mujaddideen is one aspect of authentic Islam. Okay, now. One aspect about the Sahaba that I forgot to mention, I should have mentioned it, is that when Abu Bakr was the Khalifa, he made ijtihad. He applied the teachings of the Prophet and applied the teachings of Quran that should I do something or should not do something. And his fatawa, his ijtihad, the ijtihad of Abu Bakr, there, people have written books on it. What are the ijtihads that Umar made? What are the ijtihads that Uthman radiallahu an made? What are the ijtihads that Ali made? What are the ijtihads Hassan made? How many of you people know that the four schools of thought, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, they agree on the ijtihadat of the four khulafa, for example. Because they take their methodology, meaning of the, the four khalifas, right? They take their methodologies and try to apply it within their own fiqh. And some of them, they disagreed with the ijtihad of one khalifa over the other. Sometimes they did that. Like, for example, uh, if one, I'm not going to mention because I don't want this to become a debate, but I'm giving an example. If one of the khulafa burnt someone, then it was considered, no, burning is only for Allah. So that was not uh, necessarily correct. Like this type of ijtihadi issues, they are ijtihadi uh, issues that are amongst the akabirin. They can resolve it amongst themselves. But some of the fuqaha, they didn't accept. But the ijma, the here, this is the other point. You know, when I'm talking about the companions of the Prophet, not only understanding how did Abu Bakr make ijtihad about so many issues, so many issues of ijtihad in his life that he had to make within the short time period he was the Khalifa. So many issues, you can write a whole book of ijtihadat of Ali and Uthman and Umar. Ali radiallahu anh considered majus ahlul kitab. He expected them to give the jizya because he felt that they had an authentic book at one time. This was his ijtihad. So when the ulama came later on, the scholars that came later on were looking at this companions of the Prophet and their ijtihad in order to make a school of thought and its process of ijtihad looking at and all four of the major schools, they look at the ijtihads of the four khulafa, for example. It's like a it, and they considered the ijtihad of the four khulafa as final when there was ijma of the sahaba upon it. Meaning when all the companions agreed, Abu Bakr is the khalifa. The four schools of thought agreed, yes, Abu Bakr is the khalifa. They agreed upon Quran being compiled, for example. Okay, They agreed upon the, 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 te, the skeletal text Uthman uh, uh, compiled, that we will do our qira based upon this skeletal text. So. The point is, what? The point is that Ijma' of the Sahaba is a very important point within the understanding of the role of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, their ijtihad and their establishment of Khilafah. Okay, now let's go to the uh, next point, inshallah. So I mentioned the muj uh, Mujaddideen that Allah will raise every century. Now, now, I talked about what is Islam, the three. Allah, His Messenger, His Companions, Khilafah, Ijma'ah, the Sahaba. 
Number two, Mujaddideen. And that's a whole subject in itself. Uh, that who were the saviors of Islam? The saviors of the Islamic spirit. The, I think, seven-volume book that Abu Hassan of the wrote. And many of the scholars commented upon who they thought were the Mujaddids of their each century. Okay? Who were reviving Islam. And all of these people, regardless of, because some there's ijma' upon, because of there's ijma' upon certain people like Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Abu Hassan Ashari, Imam Ghazali, there's almost ijma'. And because of this ijma', it comes out to the same type of Islam over and over again. But now let's come to number three. That Islam is authentic, which has to do with the first three centuries. Which what? Which you can say, uh, has what we can say alum muhammadiya sallallahu alaihi wasallam that that islam that is in love in love with the prophet's shama'il for example how he talked how he walked what he wore how he dressed how he behaved how his sandals looked how his clothes looked that is you can say the extreme if you want to use the word extreme, extreme love. But this extreme love of Allah and extreme love of the Prophet and his extreme love for the companions of the Prophet and the extreme love for the mujaddideen and the extreme love for the friends of Allah. This is part of authentic Islam. This is a part of authentic Islam. That Islam that raises the people in the past above us. That is authentic Islam. That Islam that takes the people of the past and puts it below our feet or tries to dis, uh, to to sideline them, that is not authentic Islam. That is an impact of imperialism, which I'm going to talk about later. So now, over here I want to, about Quran now I want to mention, the Quran and the alums around Quran. Now, first let me mention Alum Muhammadiyah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The, the special sciences that come out of the person of the Prophet. His Shama'il, I mentioned that. Imam Tirmazi has a whole chapter on his Shama'il. And many scholars, many, many, many scholars have written about the Shama'il, the, the characteristics of the Prophet, how he dressed, how he talked, how he looked, right? And this becomes very important for people that want to have dreams of the Prophet ﷺ. This is also part of authentic Islam. Always within every century for the last 1400 years, this tree of Islam that we're talking about, people have always desired and loved and prayed and wanted to see the Prophet ﷺ in their dreams. And so in this authentic Islam, what, for example, the khasais of the Prophet ﷺ, Imam Sayyuti has a whole book on the khasais of the Prophet ﷺ. What are things special to the Prophet that are not special to anybody else? For example, he can have more than four marriages. For example, he can pray without doing wudu. For example, he can have uh, wasal. He can have continuous fasting. He can do suhoor and not break his fasting for many days at end. Something special for the Prophet ﷺ. What are the 13 generally known khasais of the Prophet ﷺ? The shama'il of the Prophet, as I mentioned, his characteristics, how he looked, so on and so forth. The ghazawat, the first books of Sirah were on the, uh, the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. The ahadith, the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. And the, uh, the Sirah of the Prophet ﷺ. The seerah of the, the battles of the Prophet, the seerah of the Prophet, the life of the Prophet, the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ. All of this is the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. This and many, these are all sciences around the personality of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? And we find all the mujaddideen re reviving and thriving on these different aspects of the alum Muhammadiyah ﷺ. Talking about it. Almost they all talked about the miracles of the Prophet. They all talked about the Shama'il of the Prophet. They all, many of them, many and most of them. Okay, so this uh, is a common feature of authentic Islam. Love of the Prophet, extreme love of the Prophet And I don't know because many, there are things I could say, but I don't know how many people can handle what I would say, so I'm not going to say it right now. Okay. 
So those people that, I'll put it in short, those people that look forward to spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts, those people that, that looked forward for spiritual gifts, not material gifts, spiritual gifts, a special dream, a special gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that had a spiritual understanding of something, a spiritual insight into something, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of guidance, a gift they were happy that they found out that there was a problem in their heart, that they were being proud or they were being arrogant, or they had malice, or they had bad feelings towards other people. This Islam is authentic Islam. This Islam that wants to get spiritual guidance and considers spiritual guidance as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the Quran mentions, Rabbana, Rabbana, hablan, Rabbana, la tuzi' qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma, innaka anta al-wahab. The biggest gift, gift is guidance from Allah, spiritual guidance. And the biggest, you can say, curse on a human being is to, for that guidance to be taken away. Living, living your life for spiritual guidance, for guidance, for, the, for inner insight into yourself, into the world, into the world Allah made, seeing things. Now over here, I mentioned before the relationship between Sirah and Quran, if you remember, okay? That the two are inseparable. You cannot separate Sirah from the Quran, otherwise you'll go astray. And you won't understand parts of the Quran, and you'll have to compromise one part of the Quran against another part of the Quran, and there'll be inconsistencies without the timeline of the Sirah and the Quranic timeline of the Sirah. And without knowing which surahs are Makki and which surahs are Madni and which style of surahs are Makki and which style of surah, because each surah, each Makki surahs have a special style. That in itself is a proof of this. That they're pointing to that we're beginning. The Makki surahs are, for example, the verses are smaller. Ar Rahman wa Allam al Quran. Inna atayna kal But the Madni surahs, their ayat are long. Why did Allah do that? Why did Allah make this distinction between Makki and Madani surahs? And it's very clear, the one who understands this amongst many other points, the Makki Qur'an, uh, the, for example, the Madani Qur'an is talking to the Munafiqeen, to the hypocrites also, whereas the Makki Qur'an does not. Okay, so anyway, the point being that there is a Qur'an and the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, and this Qur'an is the the Qur'an that you need as a foundation to understand the basics in all aspects of Islam. But what about the future? Because when you, when you have that understanding of the past, okay, but what about how do you understand where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَنُرِيهِمْ ayat We'll show them our ayat. فِي الْآفَاقِ In the horizons. وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ In themselves. حَتَّى until We'll keep showing them until حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Until it's absolutely clear this is the truth. What is the basis of that? The basis of that are two things. Number one, the Quran and the Arabic language. Quran and Arabic language. The Arabic of Quran will point you to the knowledges of the future. This is why anyone who wants to have a relationship with Quran, the very minimum is he has to understand Quran. Quranic Arabic you have to understand. And number two, the coherence of Qur'an. Why is this surah first? Why is this surah second? Why is this surah third? Why is this? These two things, when you have them, you can now, you can hold on to the foundations of the past and move forward with Qur'an into the future and being used, you can now use the Qur'an to see what guidance Qur'an is giving you into the future, you can say. So in when it comes to issues like like Dr. Sallallahu Alaihi used to say, when it comes to haram and halal, go back as far as possible. But when you're looking at Qur'an in its timeless sense, when the Qur'an is talking about its, the history, and when the Qur'an is talking about nature, and when the Qur'an is talking about the universe, when you're looking at the Qur'an, and you're looking at the world you live in, in this time and space that you live in, what is it telling you? For that, you have to know Arabic. And number two, you have to know the coherence of Qur'an. And for that, you have to have a methodology to understand the world around you, which is, again, a very long discussion. 
But it is one of the biggest mistakes. And you can say we have two extremes, which I'll talk about later again when I talk about imperialism. But let's just say that Quran is showing its it's it's showing the ayat of Allah more and more and more. And here again, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Who can deny that the Prophet predicted the future? Who can deny? Only an idiot would deny that the Prophet didn't say that there would be tall buildings. What? Did somebody just came up with this idea? And that the Arabs that would be barefoot and Bedouin, they would compete with one another in tall buildings. Don't we see the Prophet's, what he said is coming true? Before our very eyes? So we know anyone who is sincere will know, oh, this is the prophecy of the Prophet coming true. And the people who believe look forward, in a sense, for the prophecies of Allah's Messenger to come true, in a sense. And those who believe look forward to the clash between truth and falsehood and truth having victory, in a sense. And so, there is no denial of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There can be denial of a certain hadith. But the sunnah that is taken out of the hadith, when you look at 10 hadiths, one hadith is saying A and 10 other hadiths are saying B, you say, no, I'm going to choose B because that's authentic. A is not so authentic. That, that is deriving the sunnah from the hadith. And you take guidance of, the pro, of those friends of Allah before they were muhaddis, before they were mufassir, before they were grammarians, before they were uh, uh, you can say mutakallimin before they were scholars of Islam first thing the ummah looks at has always looked at will always look at is this man blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this man a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does he have the qualities of the friend of being a friend of Allah Imam Bukhari before he wrote any hadith in his book he did two raka'ah salah he did two rakah. So he, he had a friendship with Allah. He's not Bukhari because he wrote hadith, but he's Bukhari, rahimullah. But because of why? He was a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was that man that when the whole world was against him, he said, Allah, no one accepts you. And Allah took his life there and then. That's Imam Bukhari. The scholars of Islam are those whose first prerequisite was that they were the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah had put some guidance in their heart. And these people were people who loved Allah and His Messenger. So there's a Quran of the past which is tied to the seerah. And then there's a Quran that, Allah, that is timeless. And you can read the present world through it. And that is Quran in Arabic, number one. Number two, Quran and the coherence of Quran. And mostly in the pattern of uh, of different patterns, but one of the most important ones is given by Mulna Farahi. Now the next source of guidance is Khurasan, especially in the end of times. And over here, now the Mujaddideen and Khurasan have merged. Why? Because for the last 400 years, you know, most of the Mujaddideen, they wrote in Arabic for the first 1,000 years. Then after that, for the next 400 years, almost all the major books were not in Arabic, they were in Farsi. Mana Rum wrote in Farsi. And for the last 400 years, the Mujaddideen have been coming in the area of Khurasan. Starting with Mujaddid Al-Fsani. Then you have Shawli Ullah Muhaddas Delvi Rahmatullah You have Ik Iqbal who is, who is doing poetry in Urdu, Farsi and Arabic. You have Mah Sheikh Mahmud al-Hassan rahmatullah I don't have time to go into this. But the ulama, the revival of Islam in the area of Khurasan, in, in general, Khurasan, Bazurg, this whole area, Indian sub sub subcontinent and Khurasan specifically. Because Islam in the Indian subcontinent came from Khurasan, from Afghanistan. So it was the Ottoman, you can say, Islam through Afghanistan that came into India. But here there was a great revival of Islam. I don't have time to go into that history today, but it's a great history. But this Khurasan is another, like, and now Khurasan is a place of guidance. And the Mujaddideen have been coming from Khurasan. 
But there's another area that the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ mentions and the Quran indicates. Barakna mahawlahu, we blessed what is around Jerusalem. And that is that the people of Sham and also with that the people of Yemen, the scholars of Syria. The scholars of Syria have been very close to the ideas given by the Mujaddideen. In fact, they've been studying them. The scholars of, I don't have time right now, but I will give a whole lecture one day of the great scholars of Syria because Syria is a place of Iman. And this is why all these things will merge in the end of times. The family of the Prophet being a source of guidance as the Prophet said. The people from Khorasan, the Mujaddideen, all the in Syria, all this will merge in the end of times to bring about the true Islam again. So that Islam that is in Syria, and also because of the hadith in Lebanon, or Yemen, sorry, that includes that. They're Yemeni are people of Iman. And the people of Syria are people of Iman. And the Prophet ﷺ also pointed to his family. This is why Hussein radiallahu is extremely important in this from a overview perspective. The family of the Prophet has been coming time and time again guiding the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ in the right direction. It will finally happen in the person of the Mahdi. Right? So, why why all of why is all of this right so let's talk about that and and how does imperialism relate to this over here now i want to mention the hadith of jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam as one important aspect of this look on the one side you have the sharia which is islam and its full implementation in the form of khilafah then number 2 you have iman Iman is the conviction of believing in the unseen. What are the unseen realities that we don't see, but they exist? They exist more than this reality that is an illusion, that doesn't really exist. But the other world actually exists. Heaven exists, hell exists. The Prophet ﷺ used to read in his tahajjud prayer, Muhammad haqqun, wa jannatu haqqun, wa naru haqqun, wa liqa'aku haqqun. So, oh Allah, meeting you is haqq, it's true. And jannah is haqq, it's true. And the fire is haq, it's true. Muhammad is haq, meaning he's really the messenger of Allah sallallahu and he's haq. And Allah is haq, Allah is al-haq. So the imaniyat, our belief system, our sharia, our closest, our, our ihsan, trying to do things perfectly and getting closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, becoming his friend, becoming his wali, that he would allow us to perform miracles. This is something now gone because of the imperialism again. The effect of imperialism is that we want a rational Islam, not a miraculous Islam. And so now I'm going to talk about that. Now the Islam and its Sharia with purification of the soul and the sciences of purification of the soul. These two things, Sharia and Tazkiyah. Right? Sharia and Tazkiyah going side by side. This is authentic. This is the Islam of the last 400 years. If somebody will say, I look at Sharia, but forget about I don't really need Tazkiyah, he's affected by modernity. And that person who says, No, I love God, I love Messenger, I love everyone, I love this and I love that, and I love and love and love and love like Christianity, and he doesn't care about the rules of Islam, he's also affected by imperialism. Because imperialism will throw you off to the extremes. What is the relationship between Iman and, and love? None of you is a true, true believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. None of you is a true believer until he loves me, the Prophet says, more than his his father and his children and all of mankind, you have to love me more. So, those who believe they have severe love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are those people that love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
That Islam that teaches you ikhlaq, that Islam that teaches you purification of the soul, that Islam that teaches you adab and respect, of and to see other people equal to you, at the very least, if not better than you, to see each and every person, that is not an Islam of rational Islam that modernity wants to impose upon us. Islam, rational, rational Islam, the Islam that is uh, affected by imperialism, they still want us to rely on machines and technology. Whereas the Iman of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, wants us to rely on Allah and Allah alone. You fight on a tank or a horse, it's up to Allah. Who will win or doesn't win, it doesn't matter. Now, let me just in short answer. What is the effect of imperialism on authentic Islam? So the first thing is that Western imperialism was a global takeover of the world. It was a dynamic takeover of the world. It was a sophisticated takeover of the world and of the Muslim mind. And what did it do? It said, turn your eyes away from Ruh. Turn your eyes away from the hereafter. And turn your eyes away from Allah. And keep your eyes on the here and the now. And instead of focusing on your Ruh, instead of your spirituality, focus on your body. Focus on your brain, on your intellect. Only your intellect. And focus, instead of God, focus on the material benefits. Even spirituality has become, do this much azkar and you'll get this much money. And do this azkar and you'll get rid of this uh, issue. And you do this much azkar and you'll get rid of this much issue. Whereas the spirit of it is, is that it had to be about closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we could get the gifts and miracles, the spiritual gifts of doing a miracle. Yes, but that's not the main purpose. The main purpose of authentic Islam is always been Ridwanullahi Akbar, the per, the happiness of Allah, the happiness of the believers, the happiness of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This has been the goal: the Ridwa of Allah, the happiness of Allah, the con, that no matter what happens in this life, good or bad, whatever Allah is testing you with, you're not complaining never complaining, always content and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always feeling yourself that you didn't deserve this. This guidance is so big that you feel uh, inadequate to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just for the guidance of Islam itself. So what happened because of imperialism? Number one, People started like Muhammad Abdu and Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. This is where it started. Now, I don't have the time to go into the whole history. But one reaction to modernity was, let's become more rationalist. Let's deny the hadith of the Prophet. Let's deny the sunnah of the Prophet. And let's deny the miracles. These two things go side by side. Because, you know, if I have to explain them that I believe in miracles, this becomes a rational problem. So you have people like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and others who are denying the miracles of the Quran. Then, of course, those were these were the religious-minded amongst the rationalists. Then there was, of course, complete agnostic, atheistic, and statements like, you know, if you want to go to the hell, just go to the kitchen. You know, this type of statement. Or that hell is metaphorical understanding of God's punishment. It's not really like that. So, the so rationalism leading to liberalism okay rationalism leading to secularism liberalism was one reaction of imperialism to islam the other was the the ones that were religious minded they became involved in their sectarian groups i'm this i'm that i'm this and i'm that that became more important than the ummah so being hanafi or being uh, Salafi or Sufi or part of some tariqah somehow became more important than being Muslim and part of the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad 
Our sectarian divides. You pray like this, I pray like this. Why? You pray with your arms two inches higher, you pray with your arms two inches lower, and now you're arguing who's right and who's wrong. This is two, you can say, reactions to imperialism upon the Muslim world. Sectarian divide and rationalist doubt, doubting, doubt crept into our mind. Look at the West. They have so much technology, so much advancement. Now, alhamdulillah, we live in a time that anyone that has eyes can see it's all falling apart. But before, 100 years ago, people like so impressed. Look at these trains. We've never seen trains. Look at their technology. Look at their military. Look at everything that they have. Look at the greenery they have. Look at the scenery they have. Look at the roads that they have. Look at the cleanliness they have. It's like Jannah. Muhammad Abdul Sheikh Al Azhar went to France, and that's basically what he called France. He said, "This is Jannah on earth." And so, you have this. And the biggest flaw, the biggest flaw, the biggest flaw, you can say, that Shaytan crept in because of this imperialism, is that he made us away from the Quran, away from the Quran. And because we were away from Quran, we weren't able to gather other parts of Islam in a holistic manner. Our situation became like, you know, the uh, example of the village of the blind. And there's a story, you know, there's a village of blind people and the elephant comes. Now they're all blind. They're all grabbing different parts of the elephant. Someone is saying, this is the trunk. This is the elephant is the trunk. And somebody is saying, no, the element elephant is uh, like a fluffy ear. And somebody is saying, no, he's hard like his, you know, his ivory tooth. Right. And people are gathering. They're all blind. They're all gathering different parts of, uh, of Islam. Right. But they're all seeing different parts of Islam. And they're all saying, this is Islam. They're all seeing different parts of this. They're all touching and dealing with different parts, but they're blind. They can't bring it into a holistic whole, can't bring it into a living entity. And what was that? That was our, our distancing ourselves from the Quran, from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which would then give us وَاَتَصِمُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُ Hold on to the rope of Allah, meaning the Qur'an. وَلَا تَفَرَّقُ And don't be separated. Qur'an gives you that cement that you can get rise above your sectarian divide. Qur'an gives you that ability to rise above your sectarian divide. So the first thing is, and the second thing after that, is the Prophet ﷺ, which is also mentioned in this When you were divided and Allah brought you all together. Who is the person who brought them all together? All the Arab tribes. It was the Prophet. And you found yourselves as brothers by the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also a spiritual gift. You find a new brother going in the same path, same jama'ah as you. This is a spiritual gift. So, this is why we say, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطِ الَّذِينَ path, give us, Show us the path of those you've favored. Those you've blessed, bring us, have us become brothers. So, anyway, so now, the effect of imperialism was doubt, skepticism, liberalism, rationalism, and it took us away from Allah, from the ruh, from the hereafter, the, focusing on that aspect of Islam. And as a other reaction, we became involved in sectarianism. And both these reactions, the organic response was of authentic Islam should have been a Quranic response. Because in times of fitan is when you really need Quran, especially. In times of fitan is when you really need Quran. And so we didn't focus on Quran, we focused on you can say other aspects of Islam. Our sectarian divides, we focused on that rather than holistic Islam. Rather than the Islam that unites the Ummah, we were more interested in proving the ideas of my sect are read better than the ideas of your sect. Now, one last thing the Prophet ﷺ tells us about authentic Islam. 
And that is that authentic Islam is this Islam that allows people to come together and to become a jama'ah. Yadullahi fawq al the hand of Allah, the support of Allah, the help of Allah is with the jama'ah. If you have an Amir, you have a jama'ah, you have people you have, you can rely on, brothers coming together, they keep their tongue silent when their egos are hurt, they can control them. If you can stick together, this is a big blessing from Allah. This is a sign you're on guidance. This is a sign that you do purification of the heart. This is a sign that you're keeping the priorities of Qur'an on top of your own ego. This is a sign that you love the Prophet and you love the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you can be, in, if people, if 20 people can get along nowadays, that's a big deal in the world that we live in. 100 people getting along, Muslims in form of a jama'ah, 1,000 people, 2,000, 10,000 people, even though they have differences of opinion, but they, their love for each other, their love for the deen, their commitment to Islam, their commitment to the long-term benefits to Islam is more than whatever they may be suffering at the individual level. This is why the Prophet said, ﷺ, My ummah will not come together in something that's wrong because people that are wrong can't gather together. And لا يجمع أمتي إلا على إلا على الهدى. The Prophet said, صلى الله عليه وسلم. أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. My Ummah will not gather except what is on guidance. So if you have a jama'ah, this is why the Prophet said, the one who's alone, his his friend is shaitan. عليكم بالجماعة. You must be with the jama'ah, especially in the end times. The Prophet told us, صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Mahdi will do what? He'll form a jama'ah. Again, this is the combination of all the forms of guidances coming together in Syria from Khurasan. So I just wanted to mention this as what is the reaction of this rationalism is that we are no longer, because let me also mention this. What is modernity? Modernity is to think what you have today is necessarily better than the past. If you think that what your understanding of Islam is better than the people of the past, you're modern. But those people that consider, no, the people before me were better than us today. Now you are on closer to authentic Islam. The people before me are better than me. People before me had to necessarily have been better than me. They had more spiritual gifts. We don't have that much. We're living in fitna. I don't look at progress as something great. I should look at what my soul is getting or not getting as great or not so great. Is my concern my ruh and the nourishment of my ruh, which is the Quran? Is the nourishment of my ruh my major concern in life or something of materialistic nature, the concern of my life? Look at what's happening with Hajj. Is this becoming commercial? Is this becoming materialistic? So, I want to end here, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let's pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us all to see authentic Islam, be authentic Islam, live authentic Islam, be connected to the Quran, and love the Prophet وسلم, and love those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and love to do those deeds that make Allah happy with us, and never to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in good times, and bad times and always be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen Allahumma ameen ya Rabbil Alameen Thumma ameen ya Rabb.